So welcome everyone. This is the Fallbrook Climate Action Team. And if you're not familiar with us, please check out our website at fallbrookclimateactionteam.org. And we are a group of nonpartisan volunteers concerned about climate change and keeping the environment healthy for future generations. And we bring you various topics on the last Tuesday of each month. And next month, we're going to be having a talk on from the Solar Rights Alliance on June 28th. So mark your calendars for that. And we did have a bit of a change in scheduling this month. You might have noticed um, uh, the Pure Water San Diego. Uh, that was our original plan speaker. And we certainly appreciate Robert Carr coming on tonight, being flexible, moving up his schedule. We'll try to reschedule the Pure Water San Diego for another time. But uh, Robert was scheduled for next month and we certainly appreciate your flexibility in coming to talk to us today. And he's gonna be speaking on building electrification and why it's so important to get off of natural gas, try to convert over. So with that, Robert, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Yeah, I got a little bit of a cold, so you may hear me kind of do a little cough or a little clearing the throat. I apologize, but just uh, it is what it is. So really glad to be here. Um, you know, great. It's always great to have an opportunity to talk to new folks like yourselves um, about building electrification, kind of, you know, a high level, what it is, why it's so important and kind of, you know, how it can be done here in San Diego and what is already being done. So I'm um, glad to be here. Let me see here. All right. <laughs> so if we could, um, you know, I just I think you've already had these norms, but um, I, I'd like to answer all the questions at the end or put them in the chat to be doing that as we go. Um, and this presentation has been recorded. So, uh, so the what I want to do uh, is I'm going to be introducing the San Diego Building Electrification Coalition, so the SDBC for short, um, and then talk kind of at a high level what building electrification is, why it's needed, what um, what the positive um, results are from electrification of our buildings. Uh, and then we're going to kind of dive deep into kind of, you know, systems like heat pumps uh, and wash, you know, heat pump washer heater and induction stoves, things that we can do to electrify our homes. And then I'll give you an actual example of one of our other members, Tom Abram, um, who electrified his home and kind of walk you through how, you know, kind of the timeline and what he did. Because uh, it's not, it's rarely something that you do all at once. Uh, it's usually you do it, you do it in bits and, and bits and pieces. And then we'll, we'll be glad to take any questions you have at the end. So the uh, San Diego Building Electrification Coalition was formed by a group of uh, SD350 volunteers uh, in November 2020, and it's really grown quite a bit since then. It's kind of been freestanding ever since the kind of 2021. Um, and the goal was to advocate for building electrification, um, and we're a coalition of community, labor, business, faith, justice, environmental organizations all working together for the same goal. So one of the things we do is that we um, you know, provide presentations like this one, uh, to as many people as we can. <laughs> and then we're also trying to expand this education to provide trainings for builders, installers, and homeowners. So uh, especially for builders and installers, because there's, you know, there are those who are pretty competent and pretty, uh, you know, current with the heat pump technologies. And then there's a lot of um, contractors that don't know anything about them. And so we need the more contractors that are comfortable about doing it, the more likely they're going to, they're going to, um, you know, kind of promote it. And then we're also, uh, on the other hand, in parallel, reaching out to um, every city in the region, talking to their elected officials and their environmental groups to try to get them to consider um, reach codes, uh, building extra reach codes. Uh, it's already happened in the city of Encinitas and Solana Beach, and other cities are in various stages of trying to get there. And a reach code, by the way, is, is, a, is a requirement that goes beyond the title, current 25, Title 24 code. So it has to be uh, adopted um, and approved by the CEC and so forth. And um, you know, many have already been done. So people are just, you know, just kind of riding the coattails of others. It kind of happened a lot in San Francisco, uh, Bay Area, kind of and now coming down here. And so we're trying to require um, kind of like the city of Los Angeles just now requiring that all new construction uh, be all electric and there's no new gas hookups. So as you can see here, there's lots of organizations that you may already know. Um, the, you know, they're, you know, all a huge spectrum of people uh, with the same concerns. Um, and so, you know, we're, again, again we're, we're growing and growing, uh, you know, month by month. Uh, and uh, it's kind of great to see how it's, how it's progressed over the past two years. So what is building electrification or BE as we call it? 
And essentially for new construction, I mean, for existing buildings, it involves replacing any appliance that would use methane gas or otherwise known as natural gas uh, and replacing it with electric equivalent. Um, so that's mainly in buildings, that's uh, space heating and water heating are the two main uh, uses for burning that methane gas in buildings. And then that's followed closely by cooking and then clothes drying and so forth. And so, there, you know, BE is very, you know, it's quite simple. There's all the technology we need is right off the shelf, quite mature. Um, you know, on the left-hand side, you've got these, um, you know, um, heat pump for, um, split systems, mini splits, they call them. Uh, and essentially, we'll talk more about how they work, but it's, they, they both heat and cool using the refrigeration cycle. Um, and they're very, very efficient. And then on the right-hand side, <clears throat> you have a heat pump water heater, which uh, uses the same kind of refrigeration cycle to take the heat from the ambient air and, and to move it to water. And again, it's very, very efficient, much more efficient than gas power water heaters. And then this is a picture of a single burner of induction cooking. And again, we'll talk about how all those technologies work and how you can adopt them in your home. So why is it kind of so important for you know, the state, for the city, uh, for our region, is that um, there's just tons of climate benefits. I mean, um, buildings contribute anywhere from 25 to 40% of all emissions uh, associated um, you know, in our country. Uh, here in California, it's about 25%. And then of all the emissions in California, 10% um, are attributed to burning methane gas in buildings. So that's, you can't reach your climate targets uh, your GHG reduction targets um, if you don't address these, these fossil fuels and buildings being burned. Um, health benefits, uh, especially when you're cooking. Um, when you burn methane gas in buildings, you're creating a bunch of side effects, including nitrate, nitric oxides, formaldehyde, particulate matter, all of which, and several others, all of which are very bad for your health if you're not properly bedding all that outside. Um, there's a lot of um, cases where people either choose not to so use the vent or don't know to, or this there was never one in. Um, so um, it's really important that if you do have a gas stove that you vent those uh, all those fumes outside um, because it's been very clear that you can you know causes increase of asthma, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, you, you name it. It's you know people are doing more and more studies, and even when the stove isn't on, it's still leaking a little bit of gas into your home because the the, the gas pipes are just the molecules so small. There's always some leakage. Um, lower costs. Especially for new construction, um, it's cheaper to build buildings without natural, without gas hookups. You don't have to pay for that infrastructure to be taken from the street into the building and throughout the walls. Um, all these systems that are, are electric, especially now these heat pumps and induction cooktops are way more energy efficient than their gas product counterparts. And then also there's a huge public safety risk of, you know, of the cycle of getting this gas, that's fracked gas, from the ground into these refineries, transported, delivered to your home, there's opportunities for leakage uh, and explosions. I mean, so essentially we live in an earthquake country. So whenever there's an earthquake, there's a chance for these pipes to shear. And if there's an ignition source, you get a big boom or many of them. Um, also, if you remember the Aliso Canyon disaster, um, it's a huge storage area up in, up in, uh, in the LA basin. That was leaking just tons and tons and tons of methane gas. They couldn't stop it. People had to leave their homes because they were getting sick. Um, you know, and this releases this incredibly powerful greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, so, um, you know, if you get rid of natural gas uh, in buildings, you, a lot of these risks just all go away, or at least partially. So here's a, a pie graph that I was talking about before. All right, here's on the left-hand side is all the emissions by sector in California. So transportation is by far the largest in our state followed closely by um, you know, buildings. And if you kind of break out the natural gas in buildings, which is 10%, you can see the vast majority is from space and water heating. So if we choose heat pump technologies and some induction cooktops, we're really going a long, long way to removing uh, using natural gas or, or methane gas as it really is uh, from our buildings. Oh, sorry. Um, so, Again, another aspect of electrification, and the reason why people are pushing for it is that, in theory, if we can get um, you know all the electricity coming from the grid or from rooftop solar to be 100% renewable or carbon free, we can theoretically reduce our emissions to zero from operating buildings. All right. So currently, right now, um, an estimated 36% of all California's electricity came from renewable resources in 2019. I guarantee you that number is larger now. Um, and by 2030, it's hoping to be 60%. Um, on the right-hand side, we also, if you include, um, you know, essentially, um, 
you know, hydroelectric electricity, uh, nuclear power, other sources of carbon-free electricity, in 2019, 63% of the electricity we had, had um, was carbon-free, all right? And the goal is to be, to, by 2045, 100% carbon-free emissions uh, from electricity, and hopefully that'll become sooner. So again, when that, when that happens, in theory, uh, no emissions will be um, will be present or will be will be a product of using electricity in buildings at that point. So that is why it's so important. So if all buildings are electric and your grid's 100% clean of carbon, then theoretically um, we've got you know um, a lot less emissions from buildings or practically zero. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about kind of you know the way heat pumps work and what they really do is they move heat from one place to another. Um, they don't need to create it because they just get it from the outside air, the ambient air, and they move it inside. So with, if so, on a summer day, what heat pumps do is they basically take the heat out of the air in your, in your space and they dump it outside. And the air that results is cooled air and that gets pumped into your space, into your room. And that, and that heat is dumped outside. In the wintertime, that process is work. It's, it's just the same refrigerant cycle, except that they, just, they reverse it. And so what happens is that even though the air outside may be cold, it still has energy in it and it takes the energy out of the air outside and dumps it inside. Again, it's just taking energy from one place and moving it to the other. So there's a lot of people who say, well, um, you know, in really cold places like Michigan or Wisconsin or, you know, Canada, heat pumps won't work. Well, the most, the, the, the largest adoption of heat pump technology for space heating is in Scandinavia. And so, I mean, they're, they're, they're slightly more robust, but they absolutely work in cold weather. And so that's one big myth that um, people like to kind of put out there and it's completely false. Um, and also they're very, very efficient. So with most space heating, usually you have to burn something and then try to capture all the heat that you can from it and then you move it to where you need it. So um, by not having that ignition source and need to burn something, um, you're, you're just basically become anywhere from 200 to 400% more efficient. So three times about more efficient than your gas powered furnace. Um, because we're not having to create anything. And so like nowadays, some like with water heaters, there's some that are gas that are very efficient. They can capture almost 95% of the heat that's released from that, from that combustion. But it's still, that's, you're still missing the 5% and you still have to move it afterwards. So that's why there's so much efficiency compared to other ones. So your current um, speeding systems usually are a centralized furnace with an air handler in it. Um, so again, it, it you know burns the fuel. You have a heat exchanger, and then the air is basically pushed through it, and it goes throughout the house. All right. So a lot of people are like, well, if I already have central air, well, what you can do is there are heat pumps that can adapt to that kind of te that technology and work with it. Um, so they might be a little bit more upfront cost, but um, that's something that people are concerned about is that if they have already have a central air, that it wouldn't the heat pumps are not compatible with it, and that's actually not the case. So um, again, this is you know your typical air handler and furnace, and then you know what you would, what you're basically seeing is that nothing really would look different um, except that you're not burning anything in your house. Um, that's the great thing about these systems is that they're totally compatible with your existing. Even if you have ducted systems, most of the many places that people know about are are ductless, um, where they they have the air handler actually on the wall. Um, but they also are, there are um, heat pumps that can basically kind of plug and play to the existing uh, air handler in your house, your central air. So that's really good. Um, there's several kinds. So a lot of times, you know, in the past, you had a wall furnace maybe, um, or you had in window air conditioners. All right. And these can be replaced by ductless mini splits. All right. Um, they're, they're very, very common. They, you know, almost everything like this usually originates somewhere outside the United States and then that technology gets picked up here. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very mature. It's been around forever. It works great, highly energy efficient. Um, you know, if you go to most hotels now, you will see this in there. And a lot of people, a lot of people have small cabins and stuff have this. And so they're just, they just work great. And then you have the through the wall heat pumps, which is using the same kind of technology. It just, it's kind of, See this more on the East Coast, but they, they basically the, the condensers outside and the and the air handlers inside, and then you have the through the window one. And these are not as good just because you have to, if they're not sealed well, a lot of air can come in and out of your your space because of the of the, the, the tiny cracks that are that surround the actual unit. So ductless mini splits are always the way to go, and usually the recommended uh, when that kind of situation arises. 
So greenhouse gas comparison. Um, so a natural gas furnace, all right? So what this said here is you have um, CO2 equivalent in pounds um, for every therm of heating provided. All right, so you have three cases. You've got the natural gas furnace, you have electric resistance, and then you have the heat pump, um, which just has a coefficient of three, all right? So a uh, natural gas furnace releases, you know, 14 gas uh, pounds of CO2 equivalent for every therm, all right? And then electric resistance, even though it's not that efficient, is still better as far as CO2 emissions. Um, so if you, you know, for some reason you have electric resistance, it's still better than your natural gas furnace. Um, however, this due to the way it works, basically resisting the flow of electricity, um, it's not that efficient, but it, but it, is, it does work. Um, and then to the right, you have you know, heat pumps that have a coefficient of less than four, um, or four pounds of CO2 per one therm. And then if you have on-site solar, you can completely eliminate that. With a gas furnace, if you have solar, it's great. It's eliminating other emissions associated with lighting and you know, other things that run use electricity. Um, but it, you can't do anything about the heating if you have natural methane gas um, using in your furnace, right? Uh, and then with electric resistance, um, if you have a big enough system, you could theoretically eliminate that as well. But you just have more to work, uh, more to kind of catch up on uh, as far as that is concerned, all right? So that's why we're going to talk a bit more. You know, if you have if you have solar panels on your roof, there's absolutely no reason you should have you know use natural gas in your building. It's just you're wasting the electrons and you're dumping them on the grid. Uh, and not getting compensated for them well enough uh, when you can use them in your home to heat your home. So um, now we're going to transition into heat pump water heaters. And again, it's the same technology. What you have is you have a tank of water, uh, you know, the whole tank and above it is a compressor, a limit, you know, evaporated compressor. And what it does, it takes in hot air um, from the ambient air and then it, it removes the heat through the evaporation, the refrigeration cycle. And then it does through a heat exchanging elements uh, in the tank, it dumps that heat into the water. Um, and out in the byproduct um, is actually cold air out. So in certain situations, people can use this air to actually cool their homes. Um, so that's, I mean, this, we'll talk about our, our, um, our, our coalition mate, Tom Abram, as he did that, he, rig, he rigged some ducting to use that, that cold air when the heat pump is going. Um, now, the thing about these is that um, a lot of the units usually have backup electricity power just in case there's lots of hot water usage, like in the morning, everyone's taking a shower at the same time, you're probably gonna need that hybrid portion of it. Uh, most units are 240 volt, uh, so you would need to have a 240 line uh, there to, to, for it to plug into, but there are 120 volt uh, plug-in styles coming out um, already. Uh, this was, this slide's a little bit old. Um, there are some space requirement. You do need to have some airflow, um, but there, there is options. And, um, you know, again, you know, if you have, there's here, they're talking about electric tankless. I know there's many options, people where how they have that. Um, they're good, but they, they require a lot of amps and a lot of energy. Um, and then also a lot of these um, heat pump water heaters are coming with um, grid enabled technology where you can um, use it to kind of store or kind of, you know, kind of, you can move when the, when the heater's on. So say we have a big load on the grid in the summertime and they're asking us to save energy. Um, you can sign up um, for demand response in a sense, in a sense. and so SDG can say, hey, okay, anything that we have control over, we're just gonna either turn down the, amount, the, uh, the heat of the water or ask it not to heat the water during this thing. And so that's really powerful. So if everyone has these heat pump water heaters that are grid enabled, then you know we can reduce a lot of load during these really high high load times um, automatically. So that's really powerful uh, where, you know, in the past that was not available. Um, kind of really quickly about kind of a bigger scale of things. Uh, so a lot of times people are saying, well, what about multifamily homes or there's lots of apartments? Well, there's many ways to deal with that. Uh, in the left-hand case, you've got a bunch of different, um, you know, basically heat pump uh, splits here uh, that are going to individual tanks into people's buildings or sometimes they go to big tanks and they kind of work in series. And on the right-hand side here, you see kind of a storage tanker uh, tank where the, basically all, all the hot water is kind of being stored after it's and heated and so forth, but the refrigeration is happening elsewhere. Uh, and there's also the hybrid approach. So um, the, the, the point of this slide is, is that in, even in scale, uh, you know, large multifamily residences, apartments, um, and even large commercial spaces, heat pump technology works, uh, it's mature, um, you know, there's some certain cases where, you know, the really big scales of like huge um, high-rise buildings, um, you know, they're, they're still kind of, you know, 
making that getting to be completely mature, but ultimately that that's not very far off at all. Um, and now we're going to get into the cooking thing. So a lot of, you know, the, the theory goes is that the way we all got hooked on gas is that in the 50s, they're like, we're cooking with gas. And so they got everyone excited about cooking with gas because at the time it was better than the old electric stoves. The old, and even if you cook with electric now, these, you know, resistance coils, they're a pain. They're not very fun to cook with. It's hard. It's hard to really make fine tune adjustments. And then with gas, everyone got excited because you had a lot more controllability. Um, you, your food turned out better. Um, and so when they did that, when everyone said, okay, well, I want a gas stove, well, then they just kind of also just by design brought in those, well, you might as well have a heat, you know, a gas water heater and a gas furnace. And they just got everyone hooked on gas. And, you know, even though stoves don't use a lot of gas compared to the other two, um, that's how all the homes now are kind of hooked there. So um, the new technology, which is really the rage these days is induction cooktops. Um, and what they do is they use a magnetic field created right above the burner here and it excites um, the, at, the iron atoms in the pan. So the, the, the one caveat on this is that your cookware has to be compatible with it. So usually it means it's, it's ferrous in some way. Um, so if you have the right um, pan, what happens is that the magnetic field heats the atoms directly in the pan and that energy goes directly to the food. With most gas, um, um, you know, gas uh, stoves, you're capturing some portion of the gas that's com combusted uh, into the pan that it has to transfer through the pan and then into the food. And so there, it's just not as efficient. So, you know, people do this boiling test all the time. You can literally boil water in half the time using a Dutch cooktop. It's also very controllable. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you can, you know, you, you very small adjustments in power, can, you know, is, are available. People love cooking on it. There's, you know, Michelin star chefs that converted their whole kitchens into uh, induction, uh, induction kitchens. And they love it because instead of their kitchen being like 300 degrees because of all the fires and gas going on and the bad air, uh, it's room temp. Um, also, when you take your pan off, I mean, basically, um, not only does it stop actually working, but there is no heating element. So theoretically, you can put your hand on there almost right afterwards. It'll be a little bit of heat residual from the pan, but it'll cool off immediately. And the, and the really fun thing cooks do is that they put their towels on the actual cooking element right here put their pan on top, cook a messy sauce, and then it, it cooks just fine because the magnetic field clearly goes through the, 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 um, the towel. And then when they're done, they just take the towel, clean off their, their surface, and they're done, as opposed to spending hours and hours cleaning their, uh, their kitchens. So, um, the, and so it essentially, it, it takes, uh, you know, kind of like a leap of faith, um, but uh, there is a program we have uh, through the San Diego Building um, uh, San Diego Green Building Council, it's called their E -Cook Electric Home Cooktop Program, and this program here at eHomeCooktops.com, uh, you can sign up to basically borrow one for three weeks for free, um, and then return it after three weeks. And hopefully by that time you've been so excited about what you did that you're gonna go out and get one. So there's several points in San Diego County where you can get it. The closest ones to Fallbrook are either Valley Center or Vista. Um, you know, unless anyone kind of has, you know, wants to volunteer to kind of bring the program up to uh, Fallbrook. Uh, but right now you would, you would uh, sign up, you, 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 you would choose the kind of closest area to you and the spots available. Um, and then usually those pickups are on, on Saturdays and then you return them on Saturdays. So again, that's ehomecooktops.com. It's free, a uh, really good way to kind of get acclimated or kind of get introduced to um, induction cooktops and uh, we've had many people who've tried it and just said, you know, this is great, this is fantastic, and they wouldn't replace their their home range uh, with an induction range. So really cool. Um, and then we're kind of dealing with the last little bits of kind of what you can do. So standard dryers, you know, you're using electricity or gas to um, to kind of heat an element, kind of heat the air, and, and get the you know moisture out. Um, there, now we have heat pump equivalents where they use, um, you know, basically heat pumps to heat the air. Uh, they're a little bit different. They have condensers and there's some water there. It's a little bit different technology, but they work great, uh, super efficient. Um, so again, you know, usually your, your old dryer already was at 240 volts. So you just basically plug into the regular 240s. There are smaller, smaller, smaller models that use 120 volts. Um, and again, this is this is by far the most efficient, and these are coming more and more online. So, for you know, every instance of an appliance that uses methane gas in your home, there's an electric equivalent and usually a heat pump equivalent. And if you have that choice, definitely choose the heat pump because it's always more efficient. 
Um, and then a lot of people um, get concerned because, you know, you are increasing the load of your home. If you go from, you know, your space heating was gas and your water heating was gas, and now suddenly those are electric loads. And so, um, you know, most people are, are concerned that they may have to upgrade their panel um, or they don't have enough amperage to do that, or they have to kind of run some electricity, 240 lines to where they don't work there before. So there's some electrical work to do. And in some cases, that's true. Um, however, most current panels that are 120 amps um, can handle this, especially if you, if you, you know, basically wire it correctly. Um, you know, if you have a really old panel around 60 amps, you probably would want, would want to upgrade it anyway, because if you ever, if you're going to have solar panels or storage, you know, that amp, that 60 amp panel ain't going to cut it. However, there's are also some really cool, um, you know, some ways to do that. So first is make your other things like your lighting and everything else as efficient as possible. So you're bringing down your total load. You want to right size your HVAC because usually your HVAC systems when they're installed in your house were just monstrously too big. They're, they're, you know, designed for the very worst case scenario, which is almost never happens. And then you also can use these circuit sharing plugs because people are concerned about also, I also have an EV. So that, what am I going to do with that? And so what you have here is that you've got a device like this where you can basically plug into, you know, say your EV and your, you know, your, your, your heat pump water or, um, you know, clothes dryer. And you plug this one into the, the regular circuit. So, you know, usually when you're, you know, you've got your EV, you're only EV, you're only charging it, you know, in the middle of the night so that you can choose which, which device gets the power and you can switch it up. So you can literally, instead of having and adding another 240 volt line or circuit, you can just have one that, and where two share it. And you, you can do that in tandem, tandem breakers as well. Um, also analysis tools, really understanding when you use your energy. So you can kind of like, okay, like, so, I mean, maybe I won't run my dishwasher when I'm, you know, you know, doing my, you know, in the middle of the morning when we're doing water heating and stuff like that and watt dryer calculator. So there is a little bit of work you need to do to figure it out, but it's not the doom and gloom that everyone says that you have to go and do a really expensive upgrade, uh, panel upgrade, uh, lots of, you know, you know, new circuits added. It's not the case. You may have to add one circuit, uh, you know, at most, uh, and usually the panel you have is, is sufficient. So. And then also, um, if you have solar on your house, again, there's absolutely no reason you, you shouldn't be using every single electron that's produced by that panel to, to heat your home and to heat the water in your home to, to, to you know, power the stove that's cooking your, your meals. Um, and if you don't have solar, it's, it's a really good reason if you electrify to kind of do that pairing because it basically, it, if, you, if you pair it with solar, the, this, the, the, you know, the, the payback is huge your emissions associated are just incredibly reduced. Um, so it just, and you know, again, it just makes electrification, the economics make a lot more sense as well, but they make sense without it as well, especially with the rate hikes that we're seeing. Cause a lot of people are saying, well, gas is cheaper than electricity. And you know, a few years ago, I mean, it still is, but if you're noticing that the most recent rate hike we had was in the double digits for gas, and the single digits for electricity. The next one they're proposing is the same kind of thing where they're, they want an almost 20% increase in natural gas prices and about an 8% electricity. So the price of gas is going up much faster than the price of electricity. And eventually that, that, that argument about the gas is cheaper than, than electricity is gonna be false. And also it already is because it's, these, these, these um, appliances are so much more efficient that they, if you look at like, you know, basically you know, BTU to BTU, uh, you're, you're really, you know, it's really hard. There's very little cases where, you know, gas is cheaper than electricity. Um, so that's it. So that's good to hear too. That's, it makes it easier for people to make that decision. So real quick, we're going to talk about a, an example. Um, it's, it's a, our, our, our coalition mate, Tom Abram. He's one of our, um, you know, working group leaders. Um, he electrified his home. And again, you know, I, I don't know of anybody that's electrified their home in one fell swoop. Usually you're doing it in, in little bits, you know, what you can here and there, um, you know, and so this is an example of that. So he lives in El Cerrito. It's about 1,500 square feet, uh, you know, originally built in 1949 with, a, I mean, 1949 with a major remodel in 2015, and he bought it a few years afterwards. So this is the timeline of what they did. So they, they bought it in 2015, and the first thing he did, he put in a heat pump air conditioner. All right, he got rid of his gas furnace and he got a heat pump. So he basically got rid of, you know, one third of his energy use from gas about plus or minus by just doing that. And then he installed a solar array. 
um, followed closely by electrifying how he gets around with his, you know, um, you know, electric vehicle plug-in hybrid. Uh, and then he bought a portable induction cooktop just to kind of, you know, you know, when you need to water, you know, you know, uh, boil water, you might as well do it on that. Um, and then he had he installed, installed a level two charger. Again, you know, we're talking, you know, four years from when he started, he's like halfway through at this point. All right. And then he got a second electric vehicle um, and then got a heat pump water heater. So again, we're five years into this and Tom's really, he was really motivated, really fired up. But it just tells you that <laughs> this kind of, uh, you know, electrification takes time and some people are faster than others. So, if you, you know, it's not going to happen in three months, but it could happen in, in two years or three years. He just took, you know, this is the time that it took him. He installed his water heater outside and here's the ducting I was talking about. So that cold air that's produced, he has ducting into um, his, his attic that gets dumped into his kitchen. So that's free uh, air conditioning in the summertime. Um, and then he realized he needed to expand his solar um, panels. So he did that. Uh, he, he, he got an induction range, so got rid of his gas stove, bought um, heat pump uh, dryer. And finally, everything that he had once um, used gas in his home no longer did, and he was able to shut off the gas. And he's still waiting for them to remove the meter, but ultimately they tested came out and shut off the gas meter. So we're talking about five years for this project, you know, bit by bit. Um, you know, you know, there's various reasons for it. I think, I think now maybe he might have he might have done a little bit quicker because the technology was better. Um, you know, the, the heat pump water heaters are better. Everything's, you know, the, the heat pumps for you know space heating was that was easy because they were already existing uh, induction ranges and so forth. So um, so this is kind of just an example of what people do. And there's other people that we know that have done this and they had similar uh, stories, to be honest. <clears throat> and so, you know, this is kind of a, you know, right now he's got, um, I think, you know, well over six KW system. Um, and so he just, you know, obviously the electrons come from everywhere, but he said like, you know, this much is, you know, for space heating and this much is for water heating. And then a really big chunk for his EVs and his cook and dryers are here. And then this, the rest of it are for everything else, lighting and, and the such, um, you know, plug loads. So, um, you know, and again, you know, it, it, it's hard when you buy an EV, you know, a, a solar system, you know, you, a lot of times they won't let you size it bigger than, you know, a certain percentage above your current load. So, you know, maybe you might want to electrify and then put your panels on, um, you know, so forth. But uh, you could add on to it when your load increases, that's for sure. So. Um, yeah, but there's, you know, definitely lessons learned or expansion of size conduit to consider higher efficiency panels to maximize south and west because he had to put some on the east side, just, just the nature of the um, size of his roof and so forth. So. <clears throat> so, you know, starting your journey, start easy, um, you know, go in, and try an induction, uh, you know, induction cooktop, you know, and try it out, get used to it. Um, it's really simple. Um, if you like that, I mean, literally you can buy these single burners for like 75 to 150, depending on the quality of it. Um, also determine the age of your water heaters and your HVAC equipment. Cause a lot of people are saying, well, I just replaced my water heater. Why would I go and, and, and you know, replace it again? And that, there's a lot of validity to that. <clears throat> so most water heaters last 10 years. So if you, if your water heater is eight years, maybe consider replacing it with a heat pump water heater before it fails. Um, you know, cause it takes a little bit of time to kind of get that done. Um, if your HVAC's old um, and inefficient, replace it with a with a heat pump. Um, same with other appliances. So, um, <clears throat> and then also prioritize it on the, the impact. So, if you know, you know, maybe you know, space heating or water heating really are going to give you some serious savings, and your ROI is better on that. So, go for do that first. And if you're really concerned about emissions, what is going to have the biggest impact on lowering your emissions, and do that first. Uh, or your health, you know, if you're really like, I just am sick and tired of possibly breathing in, you know, nitric oxides and formaldehyde and particulate matter when I cook, because my vent isn't very good, or I don't have a vent at all, I definitely want to go to the induction cooktop. So again, just choose what you, what you think is good for you, and then start from there. Um, and then again, your, let your panel will kind of have some uh, impact on how you electrify. Uh, you may kind of uh, cause you to have to do certain things. And then also size or future needs. <laughs> excuse me, um, with future needs in mind. And then finally, um, the, um, the San Diego Building Electrification Coalition, we have a um, kind of a, a, a help group for people who are, who are trying to electrify their homes and need some technical assistance. So if you use this link right here, it's also on our website, it's pretty clearly found. 
Um, and we also started something new where we're having kind of office hours every month where um, our, 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 our experts can will be there in, in a Zoom chat uh, and in a Zoom meeting. Uh, and you can pop in and say, hey, I'm having this issue and they can try to help you as much as they can. So that's been, we just tried that last month. It worked out really well. We're gonna do it again this month, uh, I think next week, next Monday, so yeah. And then finally, uh, again, here's that, that that technical assistance questionnaire. But uh, our our website is tons of uh, you know resources of all things um, you know electrification. Uh, follow us on you know Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, whatever you choose. Our handle is at SDBC Coalition, um, and we're we're constantly retweeting and and tweeting on stuff ourselves of uh, information about electrification and, and all kinds of resources. So um, that's you know a really good place to start. So um, that's what I've got. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and happy to take any questions you may have. Um, I see that there's some, there's some in the chat. Um, so, so Joy, you had one that said, what about the county? What did you mean by that? Um, what I meant was they also um, have permits, building permits. So it seems like oh, right. that should also be a requirement of the county, not just- Yeah, the so they're, they're doing something called their regional decarbonization framework. Um, and, I, and I think they're trying to influence um, electrification that way. Um, and I, I think um, maybe if, if cities are incorporated, but for them, I, Kelly, maybe you can jump in here. Can, they, can the county pass a reach code for unincorporated areas? Yeah, so they're they are gonna they're currently uh, working on their cap uh, that will cover the unincorporated areas, including the Fallbrook. I believe 2023 is when they plan to update their climate action plan, and that that will most likely include a reach code, uh, a goal to to do a reach code for uh, new construction to be all electric. So it's in the pipeline for the county as well to make it so new construction can be all electric. Um, and then uh, if you guys are familiar with the regional decarb framework, the county's putting that together, but it's meant to be uh, an umbrella that will influence every city in the county, as well as the county to um, decarbonize and definitely uh, buildings are a big portion of that as well. Okay, great. And I just noticed that Kelly, you kind of um, jumped in with some questions here. So I'll just kind of just make sure everyone's happy with the answer they got. Or um, so, you know, not sure what's meant by duct list. Well, most air conditioners, they have central heating. And so the air goes through ducting, um, ductwork into the different spaces of the homes. So ductless mini splits, what they have is they have the compressor outside and then the refrigerant lines that go through really small holes in the wall to an air handler, which is usually those long rectangular things that are on the wall. And the air is hit, the air gets sucked in there and the heat is either transferred one way or the other and you either have cold or hot air coming out. So there's no, there's no ducting in that particular system. And so usually you need one system per space, um, which some people, um, but they, they're not, they're definitely, the each unit is less expensive than a standard air conditioning unit. Um, and also allows you to do zone control. So um, with some central systems, when you turn on the AC, the whole house gets cooled um, and it's full blast using tons of energy. Just, and if you're in the living room, you don't need to, you don't need to cool your, your bedroom or your bathrooms or you know other spaces when you're not occupying them. but mini splits you can just you know once you go into a room you turn that that system on cools it and the rest of the house you know so it saves a ton of energy that way as well um is that so uh cynthia does that was that satisfactory you feel good with that there you go it, it does um you've talked about some systems that went through the wall and they leaked and i so i was confused if about that and ducting because these mini splits also go through the wall. But they um, I was I, the leaking I was talking about was the gas system that goes in your house. Like so, whenever you have, like say you have a gas line to your stove, whenever it's whenever the gas the stove is off, there's still a, a tiny bits of uh, gas leaking out of those most likely because those fittings get old. The you know methane molecule is really really small, mm -hmm. uh, so any any kind of you know damage or you know lack of seal which could be anywhere along that, that line in your house, let alone the line to your water heaters to that. So that's what I meant by that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me see here. So please talk more about water heating, confused about the need for lack for electricity. Okay, so 
heat pumps need electricity. Um, and um, so they, they, they you know, the, the actual compressor on top is you, you plug it in, usually they're about 240 volts. Um, and they, they, the refrigerant system needs to basically use electricity to kind of move the refrigerant around and do this, the, um, the heat uh, exchange within the, the heater. Um, sometimes they have a, a electric resistance element also included in the tank water heater. So that's kind of just the heating element that's through electric resistance that, so if they need to, um, to heat the water faster because there's lots of use, then they can, they can do additional water heating through that element. But unfortunately that's not as efficient as the heat pump. But they do have both systems just to make sure that in those times when there's lots of need demand, so everyone's taking a shower at once, it can meet that demand. Um, okay, so Bill said uh, his sister bought a single burner and loves it. Good to hear. Um, is 100 amps good enough? Well, it really depends on what you have. There's definitely, there are examples out there of 100, panel, pump amp, 100 amp panels being all electric in the homes. Um, you, you probably need to be a little bit creative. Um, but that, that there, there are for sure. So every home's different. I mean, that's so it, it's, you know, just because it works in, you know, say Joe's place, you know, that panel and it's all electric and you go to yours, that may not work on yours. You may have to upgrade yours or do something different. Um, but usually, you know, most people have anywhere like 120 and that, that's usually sufficient. Um, let me see here. Oh, heat pump water heaters are very noisy. It takes more space and puts out a lot of cold air. So ours in the, in the garage but it saves us a ton of money. Yeah, there is some noise considerations for sure. Um, so some people have their water heater was inside of their home um, and then replace it with the heat pump water heater. There is noise when it's working. Um, I, I imagine that the, the, the manufacturers are probably working the way to make that less. Um, I haven't heard you know one way or the other whether that's happening right now. Um, so putting in the garage is a good place. Yeah, that's usually where they are anyway. Um, and then if you can find a way to kind of get get that cool air uh, on a hot day into your, in one of your spaces, that'd be great. Um, and then of course it does save you money. And as, as a beginner, what would you suggest a homeowner does first? Um, again, um, it's just, it's just what you, what's important to you. Um, if you feel that, you know, my air conditioner is about to go, I use that all the time, uh, especially in fall break, you guys have some, some, some hot days, even in spring and fall. And well, we all do in fall, but, um, you know, so you probably use your air conditioners a lot more than say I do downtown. So having a really good, highly efficient heat pump system will go a long way to reduce the emissions, uh, and make you more comfortable and save you lots of money. Cause this is a, you know, electrification is, is a return on investment thing too. Um, most of these systems are, are, are cheaper to run than their gas climate counterparts. So that's true. Um, and then let me see here, someone asked me, um, uh, are there more efficient ducting um, or ways to make it more efficient? Um, so, I mean, I'm not an ex expert on this, but generally um, there are some dampers, some people, maybe people have dampers where they can, you know, like for instance, my home, I have ducting, but I have two zones. I have one small heat pump for the, the rooms, the bedrooms, and I have another heat pump for the space here. Um, and you can, you know, some people have dampers in their ducting where you can just shut off a certain portion of the house. So the cooling and all the air goes to your spaces. Um, yeah. And then someone asked me if I'm related to Fallbrook Robert Carr. Uh, no, unfortunately, I, my family's actually quite small, mostly in the East Coast. <laughs> so, um, uh, and yeah, and again, some, uh, some people wait for equipment to fail. That's usually, that's usually kind of the impetus to do that. But so again, it's, 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 you know, it's person to person what they want to do. So, all right. Um, so glad to take any more questions people have um, that are, that were not included in the chat. Um, if you have any, feel free to put yourself on mute and far away. If, if everybody was to increase the amperage of their house, would that have an effect on the um, power plants that supply us? Right, in theory, if everyone electrified at once, that would, and, and used all their load um, at once, that would put this, a strain on the grid or more strain on the grid for sure. But that's not how it's gonna happen. I mean, it's gonna take a long time for us to electrify our existing buildings. New construction, the amount of load that they add but is, is, a, is a fraction. Um, so if you make those electrified, you're really not putting a big strain on the grid um, additionally. Um, and as we're electrifying, clearly you can hear the CPUC saying we need to be adding more renewables to the grid. We need to be adding more storage. 
So that's happening in parallel. So they, they do know that if they, if they keep the grid as is, and then they ask everybody to electrify, there's going to cause problems. So they, they're not going to do that. They're going to increase the, you know, the, the energy on the grid. They're going to increase the resilience of the grid through storage and other means. So that when we do finally get to where most of the buildings are all electric, um, the, the grid is very much there. And also there's the thing I was talking about, the internet of things, load shifting. So <clears throat> if everyone's air conditioner and water heater <clears throat> and what have you are talking to the grid and the grid's like, hey, we're having a brownout, we're having a brownout, everyone stop working. Like they'll, they'll say, okay, water heaters, you can't, you can't, you can't work right now. And then I'm going to change everyone's thermostats to 80 degrees. So by doing that, you can dramatically reduce the shift uh, on the, the load on the grid. And if you make homes, just buildings and more energy efficient in general, you're really going to um, you go a long way to kind of alleviate that problem. But so everyone, that, that is an argument says, well, if we, if we do everything at once, it's going to, the grid's going to blow up. Well, one, it's not going to happen that fast. And the grid will grow as we electrify. Got a question. <laughs> What kind of pushback are you getting from uh, the public utilities and from SDG&E in particular? We know that they're working very hard to fight solar. What about this? Um, you know, they, they make money off gas uh, and selling you gas. And so it's a threat to their business model. Uh, they're not really too excited about it, especially mostly about the pace of it. I think they deep down realize we have to electrify for climate change sake, um, but they'd much rather it be very, very slow. Um, and they always, then they also are talking about this hydrogen that their, their new, de, you know, decarbonization to 2045, where they say, well, we're, you know, instead of using natural gas, we'll slowly start to shift to hydrogen gas, um, which again, it's just, it's a fallacy because the, the way they're going to make that hydrogen produces way more emissions than if you just use gas. And then hydrogen is an extremely small molecule. So they would have to spend billions and billions of dollars re- uh, retooling the infrastructure to bring hydrogen in your home. And nobody wants to have hydrogen gas in their home. It's explosive. I mean, it's more explosive than methane. You know, so it's, it's, it's just their way. They're trying to slow it down. <laughs> They're not that happy about it. Um, and that's why we have a coalition is because we have to basically kind of be the other side of the argument and say that, you know, that we understand this, their business model. Um, there's lots of other groups that are afraid of this because they may lose their light livelihood. Um, and, you know, we're willing, people like us are willing to, to talk about it because we, we don't want people to lose their jobs. We just want people to have, you know, enjoy their homes like they normally do, but do it with electricity and, and reduce our emissions. So, <laughs> yeah, so most utilities right now have, are, are not too happy with the pace of what we're, at, what we're suggesting. What about on-demand um, electric water heaters? <laughs> um, for a specific room or a specific shower or something like that right <laughs> those are, are those are common um you know when needed and they are they, they are more efficient than say tankless um gas water heaters <laughs> however they use a um a, a high amperage um electric resistance element which uses a lot more energy than a heat pump would so um, you know, I, you know, it's so if you, if, it, if that, if you, your need is that and you had, and the heat pump, the heat pump can't work as fast as that. But so if you have to have it, you just, you know, if you can have, you know, somehow have the, your load met with renewable energy, it's okay. Um, but there may be cases where if you just look at it, there may be a heat pump equivalent that would work just as good and, and save you energy and save you money. How about electrical? <laughs> How about what? The electrical, um, Tankless, I think you're talking about. Yeah, I think there's similar technologies. Yeah. Is that more efficient also? Uh, than gas? I, I don't know. I mean, I think they're either equivalent or slightly more efficient. I mean, again, I show you that graph where you have the, the, you know, the, the, the furnace versus kind of like the other, other two. <clears throat> so I think they, they're slightly more efficient. But you can, but again, the heat pumps, you're going from like, you know, you know, gas to slightly better to way better. So again, if you if you're what you're trying to do, it can be done with a heat pump. Do it with a heat pump, and if it and if it, the demand is just too like you just need that water right away, and the heat pump at, well, that you you don't find any heat pump technologies that can do that, then I would stick with the the electric um, option. My concern was that we waste a lot of gas, you know, getting hot water to the other side of the house, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking we're going, we're putting another water heater at the other end of the house. And I was debating between what you're talking about and the tankless kind that might just be right there at the, you know, at the shower or near the shower in that right. range, rather than trying to, and putting one 
uh, at either end of the house rather than try to circulate water through the house because you lose a lot of water. Oh yeah, um, and, and yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely go with, you know, doing a, another heater, you know, on the other side of the house so you can, you don't, cause I mean, ultimately there's something called the water energy nexus. And, um, you know, if you use less water, um, especially hot water, you're actually, you know, you're saving a lot of energy as well. And, you know, there's a lot of energy in moving water, treating water uh, before it even gets to your house. So if you're using less, you're really you're also kind of reducing emissions upstream as well. Um, so when you're the situation you're talking about, when you're just basically running water out of your shower before it returns hot, unless you capture it and reuse it, you're just wasting it. Um, so I would for sure, um, you know, again, this I would I would go and just do your due diligence, kind of re, um, do some research. Um, I would maybe ask that question to, uh, to our uh, technical support folks on that website. Uh, again, because they're a little bit more knowledgeable about these very kind of nuanced things than I am. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not 100% sure that, you know, you know, which what is the very best way of going about that in that situation. Yeah, I have one one thing to consider that I can mention, which is that the um, electric tankless takes a lot of energy. Um, and you probably will need to upgrade your electric panel if you're going to go tankless for your electric. And it's just because they have to very quickly heat up the water right when you need it. And so there's a big surge of electricity that's used right at that moment that you need to use it. Um, and the difference with the tank is that it can heat up more slowly over time and it, it won't have that big peak all at once. Oh, great, thank you. Your final questions for Robert. I think that's our fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Our pleasure being here. Robert, uh, uh, could you yeah. put up that screen again that showed your recess, your resource number? I didn't get it. It went down too quickly. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about the very last slide I showed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's our website. Um, we have our resources tab. Again, if you scroll through the, the splash page, lots of different things. Um, if you want to find a contractor, this is a great resource as well. Clean Energy Connection. Um, you can put in your zip code and they'll um, give you contractors that are vetted for heat pumps and so forth. Our e e hook, cook, um, or the cooktop programs right here. Uh, cool video on kind of the 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 the, uh, the bad health uh, you know things of cooking and and actual particulates being measured at the time. It's quite shocking actually. Um, and if you go to our resources page, um, again you're going to see. Um, the resources. So technical assistance is right here. Was that what you were looking for in particular? Whoever was asking to look the resources. Cynthia, is that what you're looking for? Sorry, that was me. I had my sound turned off. Yeah. Okay. I was just getting, trying to get the address to get, get to you. Okay. So for the, oh, it. Yeah. And so the address for us is stbec.org. So let me go ahead and there, so. Let's go back to that home page. Yeah. So it's stbec.org. But it leads into our next month's presentation, which will be on uh, solar energy. Cool. Yeah, definitely be uh, advocating for, you know, for them not to change the, the NIM 3.0 they have currently is, is not going to be good for solar homeowners. They want to tax just the fact that you're on the, the grid, you know, $8 per kW in your system. It's just something ridiculous. So uh, we're fighting the fight here on our end uh, with lots of other groups here in San Diego to make sure that, the, you know, we keep solar power um, reasonable for homeowners uh, and kind of still uh, wait, you know, you can pay back the system in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Okay. Good. Well, Robert, thank you so much. We appreciate again, your flexibility and, um, moving up a month <laughs> and joining us and, um, and your presentation. So really interesting stuff. I think it's, it's kind of a new concept that mm -hmm. many of us hadn't heard of. So yeah, and really it's, it's, and it's really in the news, you're going to hear more and more about us. And now you know what they're talking about, um, you know, and also just kind of a shameless plug on our end. So if you really want to hear more news and stuff, again, like follow us on Twitter, become, a, I'm just, you know, get a newsletter, SDBC newsletter, really great way to get some really kind of really 
factual information uh, kind of, you know, from the people who are looking for it and know what to look for. So yeah, some great articles and such. Very good. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks again. And thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Have a good thank evening, you, everyone. All right. Now I'm going to grab a glass of wine. There you go. <laughs> Take right. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.